So in the cases like that, like something like drones and something like surveillance, basically the argument is that we sort of test this stuff out across the world and then we sort of bring it home and use it against ourselves here. Like is that test run? Is that just the government's way of we start hearing these words and it's about protection or something and that slowly we then just acquiesce to it happening right here. Yeah, so again, it's not necessarily one of those, we are doing this explicitly mm -hmm. abroad to try to do it at home. Right. Um, but one thing that we can see in the U.S. is that for, if you look at a spectrum of functioning governments, uh, whether you like it or not, U.S. government, relatively well constrained, relatively well functioning compared to what else is out there. Mm -hmm. um, However, if you take the U.S., and other governments too, for that matter, outside of their own geographic boundaries, their constraints are much weaker mm -hmm. or altogether absent. So there are lots of U.S. interventions, for example, uh, including things like the 2003 invasion of Iraq, which are done without approval of the U.N., mm -hmm. um, and yet there are no sanctions for that. Um, we talk about other reasons why maybe those constraints aren't there. Um, so you go out, you are facing, you being government, facing weaker or absent constraints, and so you can maybe try things and do things that would not fly uh, domestically. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that those things don't wind up showing up back at home. So we identify how it is that those things come back. So one way is through what we call human capital. So just the skills that people possess. Mm -hmm. So in order to be successful in a foreign intervention, whatever your role is, you have to either possess or develop particular skills and characteristics. Uh, when you finish with that foreign intervention, the individuals who are involved, they don't suddenly forget that knowledge. Right. They bring it back with them. Uh, this relates to uh, the like administrative dynamics of the organizations in which these individuals operate. So whether that's a public enterprise or a private enterprise, uh, they may be well known for a particular skill or it may just be the attitudes that mm -hmm. have been cultivated uh, as a result of these foreign interventions that they then bring back with them and implement uh, into these organizations. Uh, and physical capital, so the kinds of technologies that are developed uh, drones is a prime example. Uh, drones are developed for use abroad. Uh, been used for a really long time, but extensively throughout the war on terror. Uh, people come back from these interventions. Uh, they see the potential use for this technology that they have become very accustomed to and then push to have them used uh, domestically. Right, some of that stuff I suppose, at least on the technological side, can be used for good, right? Like Amazon using drones now, to, if it's gonna get you your stuff quicker and they got some of the technological know-how through a military thing, that, that could be seen as positive. Now having drones flying over us, spying on us all day, this could be a problem. Of course, it's not to suggest that anything that comes out of a foreign intervention is necessarily mm -hmm. bad. Mm -hmm. So I think drones is a fantastic example because there are certainly uh, instances where drones have very positive uses. Mm -hmm. I am really excited for the day that I can get food delivered by drone. Yeah, it's coming, it's <laughs> I, coming, yeah. I, I will greatly look forward to that day. Yeah. Uh, drones have been used for search and rescue, they are used extensively in agriculture, and those are all things that I, I I think most people would agree are are, are great. Uh, most people probably wouldn't have too much of a problem about those or right. with those. Um, but once you start getting into those issues of surveillance, mm -hmm. uh, weaponized drones. So uh, you have police departments who are equipping drones with, uh, at this point, I think mostly uh, less lethal uh, weapons. You start getting into those kinds of areas, and obviously you have people who look at that and go, whoa, 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 right. uh, what's happening here? And it also goes to what you said earlier about sort of the creep of all this, because you just said the phrase less lethal weapons, right. but it's almost like, well, now you've just paved the road for eventually they will have the, the lethal weapons on them. There are some states that are trying to prevent that from happening. Uh, other states, not so much. Um, and drones are an interesting, uh, area of study because they're not a new technology, but the rate at which they are being used is substantially greater than at any point before. Mm -hmm. And so you are now seeing the explosion 
of the use of this technology. Yeah. Uh, and so the question again comes to those, how do you get the uses that you want out of those, but avoid uh, those things that maybe we, we don't want. Right, and all of these unintended consequences. Uh, when I lived just across the hill in West Hollywood, there was a guy that was flying a drone around the neighborhood constantly. So not only do you hear it, and you can see it obviously, but I, you know, I had a little outdoor patio and it was like, I didn't know, does this guy have a camera on this mm -hmm. thing? And is staring at me? Now that's not the government, well, for all I knew it was the government, but I'm assuming it was somebody in the, in the local area. But it's like, you just start giving away your privacy. You don't even realize what's happening. And next thing you know, you've got a drone and they've got a drone and everyone's looking at everybody and then who can hack into all of this stuff? And right. it's I a mean, big mess. There was a, uh, an individual in my neighborhood who has a drone and he likes flying it. And at one point there had been a couple of kids who'd been breaking into cars in the neighborhood. And so he offered to fly his drone around. Uh, and sure enough, within you know just a few days of this being offered, you have people in the neighborhood who are saying, "I don't want that thing flying over my house because uh -huh. they're genuinely concerned for their their privacy." Right. Uh, and so you get into a lot of really interesting uh, legal issues, issues of privacy, social issues. I think with drones, and so it'll be really interesting to see how this continues to unfold. Yeah. Let's circle back to the surveillance stuff related to the state, though, because I haven't done a tremendous amount on it in just in the last two years or so, because I feel like we don't really talk about it that much anymore. Like there was a point maybe four years ago mm -hmm. when all the, the NSA stuff first got released and that ridiculous testimony that James Clapper gave in front of the Senate House Committee and just, and all, and Rand Paul's filibuster and all that stuff, where it was like, it, there was a moment where it felt cool to be like against the surveillance state. And then I think that kind of disappeared very quickly. And it seems like we don't talk about it anymore. Do you, th you think that's fair to say? I think that there are people who are still talking about it. Um, I do think, though, that there is a definite ebb and flow to when people are talking about it and not talking about it. Uh, when the Snowden leaks came out, you had a lot of people who were talking about it. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, Thomas Drake, you had a lot of people who were talking about it. Um, now, maybe not so much. Um, and people... Surveillance is a, is a hot button issue, um, even for people who tend to be um, inclined toward a smaller government or a more limited government. Mm -hmm. When people talk about surveillance, uh, they will usually say things like, well, but it's making us safer. Um, or uh, I know my dad going through the airport, for example, of like, well, you know, as long as, you know, I don't have anything to hide, therefore, yeah. uh, oh, this no, is Oh, no, that, that's, the, that's the worst one I know, to use. It's, oh. it's the worst, I try. Yeah. Have you made any headway there? That's the worst one to use. Uh, you know, maybe, but there are times to just, you know, <laughs> you, 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 pick, you pick your battles with your parents. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair, we don't have to turn this into a major uh, psychotherapy no, it's uh, good. situation. Um, but what happened there that we don't, it seems like just at least generally speaking, we now have just accepted that there's a certain amount going on between phone calls and internet and back doors on websites and all of this other stuff. Like we've just kind of all accepted it. Is that just a function of living in a Western democracy where we've got it pretty decent and you just, you can't fight everything all day. I, I like think, that's partly what I think it is. I think a lot of it comes back to that fear issue that we, we talked about earlier is that people are genuinely pretty bad at assessing risk. Um, and that's not to say that people aren't smart, just that people tend to not do a very good job of uh, knowing how much of a threat that something is. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that people get complacent. Uh, so now, so the, the TSA example again, you go back before the year 2000, and that seems absolutely preposterous. Now, yeah. people just kind of take it as a as a as a given. And doesn't so much of it seem like theater to you? Like whenever I go through, I travel a lot, and it's like when I go through all this, so much of it seems like sort of nonsense. Like they made me throw away my uh, my hair gel, mm -hmm. 
And it was like, I had this new gel, like obviously, I was like, you want guys wanna smell it? Like I'll put it in my hair right now, like I'm not trying to build a bomb here, I only had a carry-on, a little backpack with me, like you can look at everything else, I can't build it. Like that it just seems like, well this is why we do this and this is why we do this. And they were throwing away all this like perfectly good stuff and fresh bottles of water and all this other stuff. Can't be economically sensible either. There's a lot of discussion about the TSA as security theater. Um, Pretty much any report that you read about the TSA indicates that they are not effective at all at yeah. reducing any kind of terrorist threat uh, and are spending a ton of money on an annual basis. Uh, it comes back to that bureaucracy it, yeah. point. Uh, because then when you have the TSA who is giving itself an exam and it fails 95% of the time, uh, it is not a time for reflection of, well, is this really doing the job that we want it to do? Instead, it's a, we need more we personnel, need more yeah. we need more money, we need better technology. Um, and Wait, let's not gloss over that. So they do these things, right? They do these tests where they have people try to get stuff through and oh, it, fails, it fails something like 95% of it's the time. It's astronomical. Right, so people are getting in with knives and all sorts of other crazy things. Right. And then the answer is not how do we fix this. The answer is always we got to throw more money because it goes back to to the earlier thing. Right. So about. the the response is because when you when you're confronted with failure or less than stellar performance as a bureaucratic agency, you've got a couple of different choices. You can decide well that didn't work. We should disband this and try something else, or Ugh. you can say this was really not our fault, it was because we didn't have the funding that we needed. Yeah. We didn't have the technology that we really needed. Uh, and so there's always that fallback of, it's not failure on our part, mm -hmm. it's failure because we didn't have the resources that we needed. Yeah, and, it, and there's the same political problem that you mentioned earlier about closing down you know, a, a tank manufacturing place that we don't need. It's that if any politician was like, you know what, we're gonna cut the TSA by 20% and try to streamline it, whatever, and then there was a terror attack, well, that guy's gonna be voted out of office immediately, if not impeached or some other situation. So we, we've really created this mo this like self-sustaining monster here. Right. How do we beat this monster? Give me some answers here. It's the million dollar question. Yeah. Uh, I challenge this, my students with this all the time, that if they can figure out uh, things like a alternative drug policy that is politically viable, mm -hmm. uh, a war on terror policy that is politically viable, uh, or Social Security, that's the other <laughs> one. Uh, if they can figure out a workable solution, uh, please go and collect your billion dollar check, yeah, yeah. retire, uh, and let me know. Yeah. It's, these issues are really complicated. Uh, and one thing that I know I find uh, really humbling uh, is that I don't have the answers. Uh, and I don't think anybody really does. So when you look at issues like surveillance, when you look at things like police militarization, when you look at things like the war on drugs, you are confronting a potentially infinite number of vested interest. Mm -hmm. I think at a bare minimum, changing any one of those things requires a massive shift in public opinion, which oftentimes I think is a pretty heroic assumption mm -hmm. in and of itself. But even if you do have that major shift in public opinion, then you have to figure out, well, how do you disentangle these interests that you've spent in oftentimes the decades cultivating these relationships between government and private industry? How, how do you go about divorcing those? Mm -hmm. And I don't have a clear answer. I've had a lot of academics in here. I don't know that I've had anyone say that they don't have a clear answer on something. That's actually quite refreshing. Oh, well, thank you. It's, yeah. uh, it's, it's true though. Um, I get really nervous when I hear uh, economists saying that they have a very particular policy prescription of this will fix whatever the problem is. Mm -hmm. um, because one thing that economics teaches us is that every policy has costs and has benefits. And so no policy that you implement is going to be perfect. Um, at the end of the day, the question that we want to ask is how good of a job do the policies that we are implementing do of achieving the particular goals that we're interested in working toward? Mm -hmm. uh, Does anyone check this stuff? Does anyone go back and go, let's, you know, like when, when they were just trying to get this other healthcare, the Trump healthcare thing, or the Paul Ryan healthcare thing, whatever it is, passed, and it was like, well, the CBO said it'll cost X amount, and, 
And it's like, well, they had projections when Obamacare was coming across. Like, does anyone look back and go, because I just don't trust any of the numbers. You know, like, you're giving me a number before this thing is kicked in. Like, we crunched some numbers, but as you're saying, there's all these unintended consequences, all these other things that happen. Does anyone ever go back and go, you know, let's look at all the projections that the government made, all these nonpartisan groups and all this stuff for the last 20 years, and did anyone get any of these projections right? Did, I feel like they probably are never right. I mean, anytime we're doing forecasting, uh, you have to make certain assumptions. Uh, sometimes the assumptions that you make wind up being pretty good, and other times they are totally off the mark. Yeah. Uh, I think it's something that you know economists have predicted twice as many recessions or something as there have actually been. Hmm. Um, but certainly, if you go back and you look at uh, what people have said with regard to policy, um, you'll find that some people have maybe been accurate. Some people, a lot of people, have, have not. Um, do we learn from the mistakes right. that I we guess, have made? I guess that's the real thing. Um, I think that that's a, a taller order. And again, I think it comes back just to the very simple, what incentives do you face? Uh, even though people might be aware that a policy hasn't really been effective, mm -hmm. uh, does that really change the motivation that they have for continuing the policy? Yeah. And in a lot of cases, the answer to that question is no. Yeah, so you've done a lot of videos with Learn Liberty about s some of the stuff we've talked about, and we'll, we'll link to some stuff below so people can check that. Also, one of the other things you talk about a lot is, is police militarization and how we've watched that really expand. I think it's direct, directly related to everything going on with the surveillance state. So how much has this expanded? You know, we see now when there's riots and whatever, we see things that look like tanks on our streets. We see uh, police officers that look like soldiers. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we saw that not too long ago. You didn't. So the trend of police militarization is something that um, people really talk about starting to happen in the 1960s. I think there were some trends prior to that, uh, but it didn't really take off like it did until you hit uh, really uh, Vietnam and then war on drugs. Uh, and that actually is one of the things that we talk about in looking at and linking up uh, foreign policy to domestic uh, domestic consequences. Mm -hmm. So police military, sorry. Yeah, no, so in this case, like we had the Vietnam War, we then get protests against it, and then the state kind of uses that as an excuse to become more militarized. SWAT that... teams are probably one of the best examples. Mm -hmm. uh, SWAT teams are now something that pretty much any moderately sized uh, police department has. So if you have a town of 50,000 or more people, mm -hmm. chances are you have got a, a SWAT team. So special weapons and tactics teams, uh, also referred to as police paramilitary units or PPUs. Mm -hmm. So the fact you've got the word military in there, I think is fairly, uh, <laughs> yeah. fairly pointed. But where did those come from? we actually know exactly where they came from. Uh, you have two people who are generally considered responsible for SWAT teams, uh, Daryl Gates and John Nelson. So John Nelson is a, was a former Marine, a Vietnam veteran. He was part of the elite force recon unit. So this unit was tasked with going deep behind enemy lines. Uh, and despite having the name reconnaissance in the title, they were actually a very effective killing force. <laughs> uh, they engaged the enemy, I think it was something 90% of the time, which was incredibly high. Um, and he came back, uh, joined the LAPD, and you have the Watts riots. <laughs> and looking at these uh, race riots, uh, he goes to his boss, so Inspector Daryl Gates, who's a World War II veteran, uh, and says, hey, I have an idea of how we might be able to better control crowds. And he suggests modeling a unit after these recon units uh, that he'd been a part of in Vietnam. Hmm. And so Gates likes this idea, runs with it, uh, and what was originally supposed to be called the Special Weapons and Attack Team, but it was thought attack was <laughs> politically attack impalatable. Uh, SWAT team was born. Uh, it's modeled after uh, that particular unit. Uh, according to the LAPD history, every member of the original SWAT unit had prior military training. Mm -hmm. uh, they were interested in, and if you read uh, Gates' biography, uh, he talks about uh, watching what was happening in Vietnam, getting training from the military. Uh, and so you start to see these kinds of very intimate connections mm -hmm. uh, that are happening between police and the military. Uh, and they're 
interested in using not only those mentalities that they've cultivated abroad, mm -hmm. but they're also interested in using those technologies that yeah. they've developed. How do we, well, if, if you had your druthers, would these things just not exist at all? Like policing would just be purely the way it was before all this? So policing historically in the United States um, has been distinct from the military. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the Constitution, if you look at laws that came after that, probably the big one that people point to uh, was enacted right after the Civil War called the Posse Comitatus Act. Uh, and I don't even know that one. So What's that one? Posse Comitatus literally translates to good. a force of the people. And so the purpose of this law was to separate uh, police from the military. So military could not be used as a civilian police force. Uh, pretty much as soon as the ink is dry, this thing is getting violated. Uh, <laughs> it's getting suspended in, I think, uh, World War One, World War II. Uh, then there are a series of court cases in the 1970s that uh, pretty much take any kind of sticking power that this thing had to begin with completely out of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so you see this big blurring of these lines. Um, in addition to things like SWAT teams, which comes within this time period, uh, the war on drugs and the war on terror are particularly important because you see that continued interconnectivity between domestic law enforcement agencies and what the federal government is doing. So now you have police departments who, instead of having their job, which has historically been to be peacekeepers, right. uphold domestic law protecting the rights of citizens, both individuals who are the perpetrators of crime and the victims of crime. Mm -hmm. Instead of serving that function, they are now on, quote unquote, the front lines of two perpetual wars, the war on drugs and the war on terror, yeah. which are different from other conflicts that we've seen before. Because if you think about Vietnam or one of the world wars, the enemy is very clearly defined and external to the United States. Mm -hmm. But with the war on drugs, you not only have things like South American cartels, but you have people who are domestically manufacturing, selling, and consuming drugs who are enemies of this war. Yeah. There's been a big emphasis on homegrown terrorism. And so now your police departments are tasked with another job that is not part of their job description. Mm -hmm. And so it's been a building and a combination of all of these things that I think has really contributed to, uh, to this police militarization, which now I think a lot of people um, are more aware of. Yeah, but it, it seems like we're slowly getting accepting of it because if you look at, you could look at you know something like Ferguson uh, and then you could look at something like what's happened at Berkeley and in both cases, you see a big sort of state response. But I've talked to people who said that the police weren't doing anything, you know, like at Berkeley, that the police were just sort of letting Antifa run, all, run across and be violent and do all this stuff and then other people are gonna have to step in. So we're in a strange place with policing in general too, I think. I think that police, and I've made this argument to people when talking about policing and, and talking about the military too, that I think a lot of times the job that's been pushed on members of law enforcement and members of the military is particularly unfair. Um, one thing we talk about uh, in economics is this idea of comparative advantage. You do what it is that you're particularly good at. Um, <laughs> right. Soldiers are not trained in, you know, to be humanitarians. Like that is not their their job description. Mm -hmm. uh, police officers, their job description is supposed to be again peacekeepers. Um, but it is a, a precarious position, and uh, oftentimes people will say things to me like, "Well, but if you're um, the people that they're fighting have, you know, tanks and." Uh, AK-47s, like, don't you want them to have uh, superior firepower? Right. To which my response is always, yeah, maybe, but if you look at what people are actually fighting uh, police officers with, um, or the probability of being shot and killed if you're a police officer, mm -hmm. uh, again, it's that risk assessment thing that people aren't particularly good at. Right. Um, so I think police have been could put, put in a position that they weren't intended to be in. Um, and oftentimes when we see police are being used, like SWAT teams, again, provide a really good example. SWAT teams are used in a lot of times in cases where people would look at that and say, there's really a hard case to saying that that's appropriate. Like mm -hmm. you have SWAT teams who are being used when people are threatening suicide. 
for example. Um, I have a hard time squaring in my brain people going out in full Kevlar uh, in a bear cat, so a big armored, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, mine-resistant vehicle uh, for someone who's threatening to you know, shoot themselves in their house. Right. Uh, part of that is, I think, part of the stipulations on the equipment that a lot of police forces are getting. So this came along with that war on drugs and war on terror. Uh, people who are familiar may be uh, familiar with uh, the Department of Defense program that allows for the transfer of excess military equipment to law enforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, part of that includes a use it or lose it provision. So if you don't use the equipment as a police department within a year, you're supposed to return it to right. the Department of Defense. Which goes back to what we said earlier, they never want to return it and right. you always want to spend more. So now you literally have the SWAT team with this, all this crazy stuff going out to, to stop a guy that maybe is jumping off a bridge. Right, and it creates a really strong incentive to use these items even in cases where they aren't appropriate. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty, I guess, infamous example would be the word. Uh, Keene, New Hampshire, mm -hmm. it's a town of about 20,000 people, uh, haven't had a murder in uh, something like two decades, uh, and yet their police department got a Bearcat, so a mine-resistant <laughs> vehicle. Yeah. Um, it's a little hard. A lot hard. of mines all over New Hampshire, right? Am I right. right? They're, they're pretty much everywhere. <laughs> and so there are lots of cases where you see things, and this is this is not to say that uh, you know police having the equipment that they need is not something that's that's necessary. Yeah. Um, but I think that we should be turning a very critical eye to what it is that has happened in U.S. police departments, because um, I think it's a it's it's been a growing issue for a long time, but when you start to have things like Ferguson, uh, really put a spotlight on it in a way that I, I was frankly surprised. Mm -hmm. uh, because prior to that, the thing that people forget about is Watertown, Massachusetts. So after the bombing of the Boston Marathon, uh -huh. you have you know police who are removing people from their homes to search for uh, the suspected bombers with no kind of pretense for thinking that they were in a person's house, mm -hmm. um, issuing curfews and things like that. And that, that to me, was a much stronger display of the kinds of things that I'm talking about, but Ferguson is what, what gets the play. Yeah, so the through line through everything we've talked about for an hour has been just sort of that this thing just kind of grows. It kind of grows for economic reasons and for political reasons and everything else. So to kind of wrap this all up, if, if someone's watching this and goes, well, I don't, I don't like that. I don't like this idea that this thing's growing all the time and taking more money and not doing things that are economically sound or socially sound, and I don't want more militarized police on the streets and all that. What, what would you say are, are some of the ways that we can start influencing our politicians and other people to, to reel some of this stuff back in? I think that one thing that people can do is to really educate themselves about things like the terror threat so knowing that you're more likely to be killed by a gun-wielding toddler yeah. than you are now, to be killed I, by I'm a terrorist. I freak out every time I see a toddler <laughs> in a wheelchair. In a, uh, As you should, they're dangerous. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, knowing that, being aware that what is happening today can and does have a very real impact on what may happen tomorrow. And that's not intended to be alarmist or a very, you know, tinfoil hat, like mm -hmm. you have to be super careful because they're going to try to use this for something. Right. Um, but to look at and be aware of these types of issues, to understand how it is that we've gotten to this point, uh, because there is one thing, and uh, we say this uh, toward, uh, I think in the, the conclusion of our book, um, is just because we see these things doesn't necessarily mean that it's a permanent state of affairs. And one thing that can be a very effective control uh, on inappropriate expansions in the scale and scope of government is the ideology of the citizenry. Mm -hmm. And so there have been cases historically where you look and people just, they're not willing to swallow certain things yeah. when, when their elected officials attempt them. And so if people make their uh, voice heard, if they develop and they articulate those preferences that this is not something that is acceptable, I think that there's a real power there. So be smart, be engaged, be aware. I think those are all the things I've been 
I've been trying to do around here. Uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed this. And uh, for more on Abby and her work, you can check out abigailrhall.com.